We are going to continue in our series uh, called Beginnings. This is going through the book of Genesis. And last week, Pastor Ron began the story of Noah's Ark and the flood. And so I want to start by telling you a little bit of a story. When I was a kid, I spent a lot of times playing video games. But I think I handled it a little bit differently than most kids. But for the most part, I'm very, very competitive. But I'm also a perfectionist. So I hated losing and I hated doing poorly. So I became an expert as w- at when things didn't go my way, at running over really quick and hitting the reset button, doing a restart, because it was, I don't like it. Nowadays, this is actually called, this is a practice called rage quitting at what people do. And it looks like a little something like a picture you're going to see on the screen. People break the things that they own out of sheer rage from, not, from the video game not going the way that they wanted to. And there are videos all across YouTube, all across the internet, that show people breaking their, their video game consoles, their computers, their monitors, their keyboards, their desks. I saw a guy throw his chair at a wall out of his anger because of something that happened in a video game. And I think oftentimes people look at the story of Noah's Ark and the flood and start to think that and start to believe that what is happening is God is sort of doing some sort of rage quit on humanity at that moment. He's really frustrated with the way that that things have gone. But I think we have to understand something. This This couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, he's angry about what's happening, but his wrath is never irrational and it's never volatile like this. But it's measured. It's calculating. And it has a deeper and greater purpose. We need to understand that to fully grasp the wrath of God, we need to see the greatness of his character through how he acted in these kinds of stories. And so I want us to understand from from the outset, we miss the point of the flood when we focus only on God's anger towards sin and evil. And that on the flip side, what we need to see is when we see his wrath Through the lens of the gospel, we see a God of goodness and love who addresses the evil in the world. And so this morning, we're going to look at three attributes of God that will give us a more full picture of his character along with his, along with him addressing evil through his wrath. And so I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 7. What we're going to do this morning is I'm going to give a background and give you a summary of Genesis 7, 1 through about 8, 19, because there's just so much to go through. I can't get through all of it this morning. And so I'm going to give a little bit of that, and then we'll dive into some points of the attributes when we get to uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 20. And so with the book of Genesis, you have to keep in mind that this book was written by Moses leading the people of Israel through the desert. They were wandering the desert, and they were starting to wonder about God's faithfulness. And so throughout the story leading up to this time in the wilderness, Moses is continually reminding them of God's constant work in leading and guiding the people of Israel. And so at this point in the story, the world that God has created, this good, perfect world that he originated to be, is now an absolute mess. And it's still actually fairly young. You see, we have to remember, God created the world to be perfect, but humans sinned and brought horrible evil into the world. Genesis 3 through 6 is all about how the evil of humanity simply got worse and worse, spiraling out of control. And so God has now declared he would bring about a flood, and he's chosen this man named Noah to be his prophet, a preacher of righteousness, and he would build an ark with the potential to save a small group of people and animals to repopulate and spread around the earth after the flood. And so in case you weren't here last week and you didn't hear the reason why this flood was necessary, let me give you just a quick little thing about that. You see, God reveals himself throughout the Bible as a God of love, moral uprightness, and justice throughout the Bible. When there is evil, a good God must address it and deal with it. You see, if God did not deal with evil, he would not truly be good or loving. Like a parent who righteously disciplines their children is actually loving their child, God has to do the same. Or think about it this way. If a judge in our world never brought about an actual sentence on those who do evil in our country and simply just loved them, no one would call that person a good judge. They would actually say that's a weak judge. So God is, what you have to understand is God doesn't enjoy this kind of action. This is not something that he is sitting there waiting and chomping at the bit to 
destroy people. What, what he's trying to do is he's, he's doing something that is out of his love and out of his goodness so that good can flourish in the world that he created. And so when we look at Genesis 6, it says that God regretted making mankind. It's not like he's sitting there going, man, I just made a huge mistake. What he's talking about is he's saying it's, it's his grief over the sin that has entered the world that he created. And so it's better to view this as a story of God being like a parent, grieving over their child's sin and their child's co- uh, costly mistakes, and that there is a punishment and a judgment that must come upon that, a, a consequence that must happen as a result of that. But God prefers to be merciful and gracious, and he must address the evil in the world. But God also knows the deepest parts of the human heart and knows that their, whether hearts will turn to him and, or if they've hardened to the point where they will not turn to him. And so now at this point in the story, God is starting over with his creation, but he's going to put parameters around it to prevent it, to try and prevent it from going to the, extent, uh, the evil extent it did before. He's going to spread them around the earth. He's going to shorten their lifespan. But most of all, he's now going to provide a covenant of relational grace to not destroy the world again through a flood, despite the evil that occurs on the earth. But mainly, I think we need to understand that this story is somewhat allegorical for how God acts with each and every one of us. Each and every one of us have done evil and wrong and deserve the punishment of some sort of flood, but God, by his grace, provided a substitute on our behalf, Jesus, that when we put our faith in him, we are saved from that fate and made new people. God, by his grace, completely washes away our evil, old, wicked wicked self in a flood of his spirit to make us new people. You see, God is a God who wants to make all things new. And so in our often our sensitive culture that we want things to be always fair. God's purposes of redemption trumps any idea of fairness because he wants to remove evil so that good can truly flourish. And so when we look at chapter 7, looking at verses 1 through 5, I'm going to now summarize the story of the flood um, up to uh, verse 8, 19. Verses 1 through 5, what you see is Noah's, Noah's family is told by God to enter the flood, the flood, or to enter the ark. The flood is now coming. And make sure you understand that Noah didn't earn this honor. It says, because I have found you righteous in this generation. This isn't something that all by his good works, he now earned it. It just was the fact that he was a little bit different. We, we don't really get like an explicit example besides the fact that he says he did everything that God commanded him. The, besides that, we don't get an example of, of God saying, This is why he earned this. He didn't earn it. He's just like you and I. He's a sinner. And we'll actually see in Genesis 9 where he makes a huge mistake, and yet God still has this covenant with him. But the idea of favor or this God finding him righteous here is something of a grace that God bestows on a person. We also know from the New Testament that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He's listed as a man of great faith. So it's his faith in the Lord that radically stood out from the world that he lived in Lived in is why God bestowed this gracious favor on him. And it's the same thing that happens for us. When we put our faith in Jesus and trust in his sacrifice on the cross on our behalf because we are not good enough to measure up to God, Then God bestows his grace upon us. So it's it's Noah had that mentality. And he revealed it by the fact that he did all that the Lord commanded him. And so what we need to understand, notice as well, when he's coming into the ark, this is something that always blew my mind when I first realized this. Because we always say Noah took the animals two by two. Well, he also took seven pairs of every kind of clean animal. So there was a large section of just seven pairs of different kinds of clean animals. And I think he did this because this was a way to have to provide food for some of the other animals on the boat and as well to do the sacrifices later after they got off the boat. But God is, as he says here in this, in this paragraph, God is going to completely wipe every living creature off of the earth. It's a complete restart. But I want, you, I want to focus in on 7.5 for a second. It says, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. You see, obedience is absolutely critical to those who say they are followers of Christ. You cannot have true faith without obedience to God and his commands. Obedience flows from faith. It is not the other way around. But this phrase about Noah is repeated several times 
to show that Noah continues to obey God along each stage, no matter what God is asking him to do, because he believes it is right for him to do that. So then you get to verses 6 through 10. You see this timestamp now that's kind of giving us this picture of how long the flood is actually going to last. And when we see it later at the end, it's going to be 377 days that Noah total is on the ark. That's a long time. So Noah, in verses 6 through 10, he gets on the boat, all the animals that came, came with him. And it's reminiscent of when Adam had all the animals brought to him in chapter 2 of Genesis so that he could name them. So now Adam had named the animals, and now Noah, with all the animals coming to him, is now going to preserve them. And I don't think he had to, Noah didn't have to take some time to wrangle them and lasso them in like a cowboy. I think they came to him supernaturally. And so these waters now come at the end. You see that the flood waters came on the earth. It's coming exactly as God had foretold. But then we get into verses 11 through 12, and we kind of see this really interesting scientific thing happening here. Uh, I watched a video on a guy who uh, studied the flood, and what he thinks is happening here is that this is an upheaval of the ocean beds, the tectonic plates underneath the continents on our earth that likely allow deep pockets of water to then flood the earth, to bring up water from below, and also magma from inside the earth to come out and form new water basins, new mountain ranges under the water. And so this would be a massive upheaval underneath the water, all kinds of crazy things happening. It's a massive, catastrophic change that would totally change the topography of the, of the earth, and at least underneath the surface of the water. But on top of all of that upheaval down below, then you have this massive rainstorm that is falling on the earth that's going to last 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, we relate to that as Northwesterners having rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but not to this level that would cause a worldwide flood. And so then you look at verses 13 and six through 16, and I love the way that this is looked at. It says that Noah is now entering the ark, and he had with him every animal according to its kind. Some scientists that I trust, they, they, what they say is, look at this. This is uh, animal kinds based on their family of animals. So let me give you an example here. This didn't mean that Noah had to have every single kind of bear on the ark in order for them to survive. He didn't have to have all panda bears, polar bears, black bears, grizzly bears, brown bears, Chicago bears. But simply one pair of a mother-father bear, single kind of bear that would then spread around the earth as they had babies, and then all the variations that would adapt to their new environments, which is within the genetic code that God had created. But notice, look at verse 16, that it is God is the one who shuts the door on the ark. He's the one that says, I am shutting the door. It wasn't Noah. You see, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He likely told people of this coming flood and their need to be rescued, but which is much like what we do when we share the gospel with people to try and rescue them. But you see that there is a time limit on it. God will not wait forever. He's very, very patient. But in the meantime, because it's up to God on when that time frame closes, it is up to us to pursue others, to share the love of Christ with them, and to share the gospel with them. So then we get to verses 17 through 24. And what I, I think what this does is this makes it very clear that this was not just a local flood, but this was a global flood that covered the whole earth. You see, some have tried to make the argument that this was merely just a local flood rather than a global one, because a global one just sounds too preposterous and doesn't fit with any scientific evidence. But I think by saying that, even if you're a faithful Christian, if you believe that, that's, you can believe that, that's fine but I'm going to push back on that just a little bit with three little points. First of all, that cheapens the testimony of the Bible since the words all or every are repeated eight times throughout this passage. So this argument makes the Bible appear to be somewhat dishonest, like it's not telling you the whole story. It also makes it silly that Noah would need an ark in the first place. If it was just a local flood, God could have just said, hey, just go over that mountain over there and you'll be fine. You'll be away from the flood if you go all the way over there. Just keep walking. And it's possible it took upwards of 100 years for Noah to build this ark. He had lots of time to walk <laughs> before that flood came. 
if he needed to get away, if it was just a local flood. But I also believe that it removes the importance of the promise God makes later on in chapter 9 that he wouldn't flood the whole earth again. Because now, when we have local floods, that would be God actually breaking his promise that he would never flood the earth again because it's, it was a local flood. And so when it, the importance of that promise only really works if it was a global flood. So really what the Bible is saying, I don't think it really works with it. But then some make the argument looking at how it says the, mount, the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. So basically reached 15 cubits above the highest mountain peak. And people go, ah, well, that's impossible. There's not enough water on the earth to cover Mount Everest at that height. But that's assuming that Mount Everest was as tall as it was at that point in human history. By this event, the event could have caused through the aftermath of the flood, Mount Everest to be formed. But at this point, maybe it wasn't formed and it was 15 cubits above. That's all it needs to do. And actually, there's been studies that have been done. If you kind of make some adjustments around the world and you lower some mountains and raise some valleys up, it would be very easy with the amount of water we have on the earth to completely cover everything. There is enough water on the earth. So God now has fulfilled what he said he would do. Everything that was not on the ark died and the flood waters, the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. So we get to chapter 8 and we see verses 1 through 5. They're saying God remembered. I want you to understand something. When it says that, it's not as if God completely forgot about Noah and all the animals on the ark and his attention was focused somewhere else and he went, oh, that's right, I got to take care of them. What it's actually happening here is now God is choosing to act on something he has said he would do before to bring deliverance. He's acting out of this earlier promise. He's going to establish a covenant with Noah. And so now you start to see the, a process of the recession of the waters. This is what it begins here. There's some sort of wind that comes along in this part that starts to help the waters recede and, and is progressing in a way so that life can now inhabit the earth once again. Verses 6 through 12 describe about a, these, this period of 40 days. It's 40 days after they land, Noah begins to send out birds. He's testing. He's doing some tests about the progress of the recession of the water. So first he sends out a raven, and you have to ask the question, well, why? It's because most likely a raven actually eats carcasses of animals, so he's trying to find out if it's safe enough for animals who need to eat in that way have enough of a food supply that they can go after once the waters have receded, but also that there is habitable places for them to live on the ground. But then he sends out a dove, and the reason he does that is a dove makes, tree, makes nests in the trees. And so it finds an olive branch, which olive trees are pretty, pretty short. And so that means the waters have receded enough that an olive tree now is able to inhabit a bird putting its nest in there. So he knew it was okay to leave. So we get to verses 13 through 19, and it took 150 days for the water to completely recede before it was completely dry. And, no, and God confirms it for Noah. Noah could probably see it, but now God confirms it for him that it's dry and that he is to come out and he tells him to be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Again, this is a creation restart. It's this, he's a new Adam, Noah is, and, he, and God gives this command again, but it's also for the animals that they need to spread across the earth. And so they come out after 377 total days on the ark. So now that we've summarized everything up to this point, let's look at these attributes that I was talking about earlier, and we're going to start in verse 20 of chapter 8, and we'll, I'll read that. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. You see, Noah's response to the gracious action of God of saving him on the ark is to worship. It's the first thing he does. He does it to worship. And it's a reminder that sinful humanity constantly needs mediation between us and God because of our sin. But it's the first time we see an altar being used within worship. And look at what it says. It says he sacrificed some of the animals that he took with him on the ark. This type of offering, this burnt offering, you have to understand, it's a voluntary offering for sin. It's an act of thanksgiving and worship that Noah is 
doing here. And it would become a practice, regular practice throughout Israel during Noah's time or Moses' time. You see, it was this daily continual offering presented each morning and evening in the tabernacle. The purpose of it was to be totally consumed upon the altar, totally burned by fire, signifying a complete life surrender to God, complete devotion to him. So in other words, what Noah is doing here is he's thanking God for saving him and his family from the destruction of the flood, but he's also offering up his life completely to God. He's devoting his whole self to him, and he did this freely. God didn't tell him to do this when he got off the ark. So this is a spontaneous celebration of his salvation. And I want you to understand something as well. When it says taking some of all the clean animals, it's showing that Noah was taking each of these clean animals, these different types, and he was doing, so he was doing a lot of sacrifices. It's showing an overflowing greatness toward the Lord for saving him. I can't even imagine what that man witnessed while he was on the boat, seeing the flood come and seeing the judgment of God on people that were wicked and evil, what that would do to a man. And so to see that God had saved him, the grace that God bestowed upon him would be overwhelming. And this is what he's showing here. So then in verse 21, it says that the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. What brings about the Lord being pleased with Noah's offering is because of how it reveals Noah's heart of thankfulness and gratitude towards God. The pleasing aroma comes from Noah's heart as he freely worships the Lord and offers him his life. So as a result, God chooses to make a promise that even though humanity is sinful, as it says, from the very beginning, every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. He will not destroy all living creatures like this again. But this offering is also more than just thanksgiving and surrender. It's also a recognition that his sinfulness separated him from a relationship with God and that a substitute must die in his place, shed their blood so that he could be right with God again. And you see, it's a foreshadow to Christ's work on the cross who died on our behalf for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God by offering our ourselves completely to him even though we too were born into sin and every inclination of our hearts is evil from the time that we are born and so god's statement here shows that the flood didn't change the condition of the human heart nothing changed it would be exactly the same but what it did is he's bringing about this complete and necessary restart to the world but that he's showing his grace to not bring about this kind of destruction again and so in verse 22, what, what this little poem he's, uh, God says here is saying is now that there will be a regularity of predictable environmental patterns on the earth that are going to be sustained by God himself. You see, this com- depends completely on God's goodness, not any on any bit of man's goodness whatsoever. And so here's our first attribute we want to look at this morning is that God provides a way to be reconciled to him. God provides a way to be reconciled to him. Go ahead, Joe, go to the next slide. You see, God's primary desire is not to bring judgment and punishment upon the earth, but to act mercifully. You see, listen to these two verses from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18.23 says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? See, God would much rather see the wicked people of the world turn from their evil and not be destroyed. So what this tells us is that God saw the people of the time of Noah's day and saw, yes, he wanted them to turn, but by the fact he sent the flood says that he knew they were not going to turn. It was done. It was sealed. But as I said earlier, because God is good and loving, he must address the evil that is in the world and do something about it. You see, we would be angry with him if he did not bring about justice on things that are evil. Just imagine that. If you see something evil in the world and God doesn't address it, wouldn't we be upset about that? So even though the flood is tragic and it's somewhat horrifying to think of all that human death that was happening in this event, but this was God addressing evil, a good, loving father, a judge, but he's addressing the evil in the world. But here's what you have to understand about what God did most of all. 
What God did, however, was take on human form in Jesus. He walked among us. He lived a perfect life and then took all our sin and evil upon himself on the cross, dying the death that we deserved so that we may have the life we didn't deserve through putting our faith in him through his resurrection. You see, God has always sought to provide a way to be reconciled to him, to be brought back into a relationship with him. And Noah's offering here foreshadows the ultimate sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. Let's continue chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has, ma- has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. See what God is doing here, starting in verse one, is God is instituting some safeguards so that the new people can prosper on this earth he has now restored. But he's presenting actually the same task that he presented to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. In other ways, he's, in other words, he's actually saying, have tons of babies and spread yourself around this entire earth that I have made. But it's also implied that these children that were to result from them were to be raised to obey God and follow his commands, something that is still on each and every one of us who are parents today. But you look at ver- verses 2 through 3, something happens here. This is a slight change in the program. Now the animals are actually available for food. For Noah and his family. Before, in early in Genesis, it says that God gave every green plant for them to eat. But now he's saying, I am giving you the animals to eat as well. And so as a result, now the animals are going to fear and dread humans. And this also, there's some sort of authority here going on with the humans over the animals. And so this is like common knowledge for us. We're used to this by now because this is the world we live in. But this would have been very new for Noah and his family. But there are rules to it. God puts some parameters around it. Look at verses 4 through 6. He says, don't eat the meat with its lifeblood in it. And so God is putting these rules. Similar to the tree in the garden, God is putting rules in place for how to live in his world that he made. You see, the reason they weren't supposed to eat meat with the blood still in it is that the blood represents a creature's life force and it giving its life for you to be able to eat it. It's It's a sign of respect for the animal, to care for the animal, not to go about hunting willy-nilly, doing whatever you want, thinking we can just abuse animals however we want because we have authority over them. God is going to be watching and hold us accountable for how we treat the animals in our world. And this goes back to God telling Adam that he was a caretaker and not a dictator of the world that he created. But notice that this accountability for the animals is not on the same level as for human lives because humans are made in the image of God, animals are not. You see, murder of another human being by a human being is a deliberate act against God himself since humans are made in his image. This is what makes it so serious and why nearly every philosophy in the world believes that murder is wrong. It is, I think it is natural within the human conscience to know that human is wrong. And so God gives the rule in verse 6, whoever sheds human blood or murders them By humans shall their blood be shed. This kind of capital punishment was required because it fit the level of the crime, of the way that they viewed the creation of God. And it shows the value and dignity of human life because they are made in the image of God. And so then in verse 7, God repeats the command he has given to be fruitful, increase in number, multiply on the earth. And so what we look at when we see this whole section, this is our second attribute of God, is that God creates parameters so that humans will flourish. Let me say that again. God creates parameters so that humans will flourish. Go ahead, Joe. Go to the next slide. Oftentimes, people view God as a killjoy who wants to take away fun from us. Or people view God as, a, as judging us for things he says is evil, but human, human wisdom says is just fine. 
But those of us, both, both of those couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That phrase to the full means abundance, a life abounding with the fullness of joy. You see, God designed the world to work in a certain way. And when we enter into that design, we open up the ability for us to flourish as the way God desires for us to flourish. But when we choose to go the opposite way, to choose our own way, we open up a way of destruction for us, whether in this life or the next. There might be temporary flourishing in this world, but there is not true flourishing the way God has designed for it to be. But here's what I want to press in. I want to make sure I say this. The ultimate way to flourish in the world that God created is to first put your faith in Christ, to recognize that your sin has separated you from him and that when you put your faith in him, you become part of his kingdom, a kingdom that changes you from the inside out so that you will live in a way that God intended for you to live. And don't forget, your obedience is not what saves you, but comes as a result of God saving you and transforming you. So I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning about this. How can you change your perspective today that the parameters of God set for his world are not limiting you, but enabling you to flourish the way he designed you to live? In what ways can you see that when you've obeyed God's commands, you've seen good brought about in your life? Or even vice versa, that when you have done evil, you have seen evil brought about in your life. I want you to make those connections to think about that this morning because God's parameters are for your benefit and for you to flourish. Let's continue. Verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. In verses 8 through 11, we get introduced to this idea of a covenant. We maybe in our culture don't quite understand the idea of what a covenant really is. You see, the idea of a covenant is a relationship with God on his terms. But this one in particular is a deeply rooted promise that is based upon God's good character to fulfill and not on human righteousness to fulfill their end of the bargain. You see, throughout the Bible, God consistently chooses a a group of people, a smaller group of people by which he will reveal himself to the rest of the world. And in this story, it's now Noah's family. See, God had promised Noah safety from this flood, and he fulfilled that promise. But you see, this covenant in particular is for all of humanity and all of the animals to come in the future. Never again will all life be destroyed by a flood in this manner. So this is a clarification of what he said earlier. But in verses 12 through 13, we see a sign of a covenant. With any covenant, there must be an accompanying sign to signify that the covenant will be fulfilled to give it validity. This sign is supposed to be one of comfort for us today. Every time we see a rainbow, it should remind us that God will not punish the earth in this way, again, even though it is still sinful. So anytime we see gathering clouds, we hear thunder, we see lightning, or we witness an intense rainstorm, we should never fear that God will destroy the whole earth again with a flood. And that this brightly colored rainbow would dispel any darkness from the storm clouds that are around us. And it's not that the bow was something, the rainbow was this new thing, but that God is now attaching this new significance to it. And so in verses 14 through 16, we see that the importance of this sign is what it communicates to people. There would be future assurance for all people, and at its root, the assurance is in the character of God. 
And again, in verse 16, it says, God, when I remember the everlasting covenant, it's not he didn't forget. He's not going to forget that he made this covenant, but it's a way of how he's going to choose to act in those situations. But notice something here. Noah is not putting in anything towards this covenant. This is God, the one who is founding this. He is establishing it upon himself, upon his character. It is all based on him because we could not accomplish our end of the deal. God is making this sure. And so here's our third and final attribute, is that God fulfills his promises founded upon his character. You see, in a typical human covenant, both sides of the agreeing parties would make certain promises to guarantee that they would fulfill their part of the deal unless, unless they would suffer some consequences for not doing their part of the deal. But notice the difference here with this covenant. God does not have Noah or humanity in general make any promises whatsoever because God knows that humans are completely incapable of fulfilling it because of their sin. Instead, God builds these covenants completely upon himself and upon his character. And this is exactly what the gospel of Jesus Christ is and the new covenant he made through the blood of Jesus. It's a work that only God could have accomplished, only God could have established, and only God could have offered to us. And it's offered freely. If you put your faith in Christ's sacrifice to pay completely the penalty for your sins and to make you a new person through his Holy Spirit indwelling you. You don't do anything to earn it. You and I don't do anything to earn it, but simply we receive the offer that has been given to us. So throughout this story, we must see several things about the character of God. First of all, that God grieves over the sin in his world, but he deals with it. He addresses it. Second, that he provides a way escape from that justice. But finally, that God bases his promises upon himself and on his character and not upon our goodness because he, he knows we can't cash that check. So when we paint this whole picture, the aspect of God's wrath comes into much greater focus. God is not a God of irrational wrath, but of measured justice against the evil in this world. He desires to reconcile those who are evil and wicked back to himself so that they will live rightly before him. So I want you to ask yourself this question this morning. In what ways have you lived in the evil of this world? Do you know that the God who created this world to be good desires to be reconciled with you despite your sin? This is the heart of God. So much so that he came and died for you, taking all your sin upon himself to pay the penalty for it. This is a love that is greater than our human minds can comprehend. Will you receive this offer today? Do not leave today without considering it if you have not yet before. And now to wrap up, to remember what we started at the beginning. When we see his wrath through the lens of the gospel, we see a God of goodness and love who addresses the evil in the world. Let's pray. God, thank you that you address the evil in the world, God, but even the evil within us that you took upon yourself. God, even though we don't deserve that any bit, God, thank you for your incredible love for us and that you have given your life on our behalf. And so, Jesus, we thank you so much for your great love, and we pray this in your name. Amen.